Thanks, Robert. Um, so originally, uh, when I had, when I sent in my uh, topics, um, I thought I was going to talk about idiomatic quantum computing as well. And then uh, Muhammad uh, sent me uh, the, uh, the sketch of, of his talk, and I realized I wouldn't have very much to say on, on idiomatic quantum computing. And indeed, not much is left. However, uh, I decided that I the last minute, probably not a wise decision, I decided that I would say something about the AI content, after all. Uh, one topic that um, Anna didn't, uh, didn't touch uh, is a different approach to uh, AI quantum computing, which is based on differential geometry. So the basic idea is that we can think of uh, an AI quantum computation as trying to perform uh, some kind of an optimization of path. And the path is the path that takes you from the initial to the final Hamiltonian. So uh, to make that concrete, uh, here is the initial Hamiltonian, and there is the final Hamiltonian. And we're trying to find the, uh, the optimal path between the two uh, on some curved manifold. So why, why are we getting a curved manifold? Why is this a problem in differential geometry? So the way to understand that is to imagine that you have control knobs. So here are these, uh, these x's, and x1 through xn are some control knobs that you as an experimenter can compute. For example, they could be electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, things like that. Uh, and together they belong to some manifold, the curve manifold n. And as you vary them as a function of time, tau, uh, you trace out a path. And the Hamiltonian is dependent on these control knobs. So here's our Hamiltonian, and it depends on this path, this vector x, which depends on time. And, and the vector x is some trajectory along this curve manifold. And in, in adiabatic quantum computing, we have boundary condition. We can start from a given initial Hamiltonian, end up with a given final Hamiltonian, the one whose ground state represents the answer we, we wish to find. And so here are some examples of such uh, uh, paths or interpolations. Uh, this is the, uh, the simplest one, uh, a, a one-dimensional interpolation where we start and by the way, I'm working in units where tau is uh, normalized time, so tau is actually the real time divided by the total time. Okay, so uh, when tau is zero, we start in now on the H zero, the initial one. And then when tau is one, uh, when t is the final time, uh, we've ended up with the final on the H one. Uh, so this, this is a linear interpolation, but we could imagine much more general interpolations. For example, here's one that depends upon two parameters, so this this would be a trajectory in, on a two-dimensional manifold, uh, which depends on parameters x1 and x2. And, x and in general, you can imagine a, a trajectory that moves on an n-dimensional manifold, as, as I started out with. OK, so the question is, now that we have identified a manifold, what's the manifold? It's the manifold of the control parameter. And typically, these are continuous. So, uh, and if they're not, then, uh, well, let's make them continuous. Uh, so we have a setting for differential geometry. Then the question is, what, what is the differential geometry of, uh, of this control manifold? And in other words, can we identify some kind of a, an adiabatic metric tensor which describes uh, this manifold? And then can we deduce from it a Riemannian geometry? And the answer is yes. Uh, it turns out that uh, this can be done in at least two ways. At least I know of two ways. One is uh, to uh, set the problem up as one where we try to minimize the total time. The total, minimize the time it takes us to get from the beginning to the end. Of course, that's a very sensible thing to do. In any other form of computing, we are trying to get uh, to the final answer in the least amount of time possible. And then it, it turns out that you can derive a metric tensor, and uh, I wrote it down here, and I'm not going to try to explain it too much, except to say that what features in this metric tensor is the minimum gap, dealt as the gap, uh, and derivatives of of the Hamiltonian as a function of its control parameters. So if you want to read more about it, uh, look at this reference. Uh, an alternative to minimizing the total time is to minimize the error. Minimizing the error means to minimize the deviation between the actual state, the solution to the Schrodinger equation, and, and, the, uh, and the desired ground state. Okay, so this is an alternative to minimizing time. Let's try to minimize the error. And if you do that, you actually arrive at a slightly different metric tensor. Um, and it turns out that this approach is uh, also tightly connected to the phenomenon of quantum phase transitions, which shouldn't be too surprising after we heard Muhammad's talk. 
connection between any about quantum computing and quantum phase transitions. Turns out that a metric that was proposed to describe quantum phase transitions is uh, strongly related to, to a metric that we obtain uh, via this approach. Okay, so uh, what happens when we, we go through all this? I just want to uh, flash uh, a result that we can obtain using this, uh, this optimal uh, differential geometry approach. So let's, let's go back to Grover's search. Uh, so here's a kind of generalization of Grover's search. Uh, in, in a two-dimensional setting, there are two, two parameters, x1 and x2, and we're interpolating between a projector, PA perp and PB perp. PA is simply the projection, or one minus the projection on the equal superposition state. And uh, PB is one minus the projection on whatever the marked item is, the one that we're trying to find. Okay, so this is, this is another way to write the Grover problem. But in terms of a two-dimensional parameter problem. And now we can try to optimize the path in terms of these two parameters. So let's try to find a, an optimal trajectory on a two-dimensional manifold, which solves the Grover problem. So the, uh, the easy case is actually to start from the one-dimensional case. In the one-dimensional case, I just make uh, x1, 1 minus x2. Okay, so this is actually just a single parameter that we're trying to optimize. And it turns out that if you solve the uh, variational problem, if you solve the euler lagrange equations, which are obtained from this differential geometric setting, you recover precisely the path which was obtained by Roland and Cerf in a paper that Mohammed mentioned, uh, where they showed that in order to solve the Grover problem correctly, you have to move fast and then slow down, uh, excuse me, yes, yes, move fast and slow down the other gap and then move fast again. This is precisely the uh, interpolation uh, or path that they found in the one-dimensional case. The time it takes you is, is order of square root n. That's just a feature of, of the Grover problem. What happens if you uh, go to a genuine two-dimensional set? In that case, and we, we can't solve it analytically, but we can solve the problem numerically. Um, so here's what we find. First of all, as far as the path is concerned, just to show you that there's a difference, this is kind of a weird plot, but what it shows is the uh, the, uh, the two parameters, the interpolation parameters, x1 and x2. Uh, so starting from zero, starting from zero there. So this way we move uh, forward in time. And uh, what is plotted here is actually the curvature of this manifold, the two-dimensional manifold. And this curvature is, uh, well, it's one component of the curvature tensor. And it, it sort of blows up over here at short times. And I don't want to get into the reasons exactly. But the only thing I want to point out in this plot is that RC stands for roll and surf. It's, that's the one-dimensional path. So you see that along this curve, we have the RC curve. X1 is 1 minus X2. OK, so this is the, the one-dimensional path. And the two-dimensional path, QAB, quantum adiabatic histochrome, is the one we find by numerically solving the optimization problem. You see that it actually diverges a little bit from the one-dimensional path. And it diverges in an interesting way. It follows a path that has less curvature. Right, over here, you, you can clearly see how it has less curvature than the, one dimension, the optimal one-dimensional path. OK, so the two-dimensional path is slightly different. It uses a little bit less curvature. And what do we gain from, from doing this? Well, uh, let's define the error between the actual final state, the solution to the Schrodinger equation, and the, uh, and the ground state, the one that uh, we wish to find, the marked item. So this, this is the error, 1 minus the uh, overlap squared between those two. And let's plot here the, is, uh, as a function of time, as a function of the total time, let's plot the difference in error between the one-dimensional path and the two-dimensional path. OK, so what this means, and this is on a log base 10 scale. So, so what this plot means is as, as you uh, increase the total time, you get these oscillations. And blue means that the two-dimensional path has a smaller error. Red means that the one-dimensional path has a smaller error. OK, so in other words, whenever you see a blue dot, the two-dimensional path wins. For the same amount of time, it produces a smaller error. Whenever you see a red dot, the one-dimensional path wins. It has a smaller error. Uh, as you can see, visually, the two-dimensional path wins most of the time. OK, so in this problem of uh, Grover search, we're, we're able not to speed up by finding optimal paths, but we're able to, for most times, we're, uh, we're able to reduce the error relative to doing a one-dimensional interval. Okay, 
So that's all I want to say about this. Uh, if you're interested in, in the details, uh, go ahead and uh, read the papers that I uh, listed up there. And now I want to switch gears, uh, unless there are any questions about this. Happy to take questions at this point. Okay, so if there are no questions, I want to switch gears to uh, the main uh, topic I would like to discuss this afternoon. And this is the, uh, the subject of uh, various uh, methods for uh, reducing and preventing and also correcting uh, errors in, in quantum computation. So this uh, is unrelated to uh, any about quantum computing, uh, although some of the methodology and some of the um, formalism will be reminiscent of uh, uh, what you heard from Hamad uh, earlier this morning, uh, in the sense that um, uh, the analysis and that I will, uh, I will present for reducing uh, errors and, and uh, basically in the circuit model of quantum computation is mostly Hamiltonian based, although not exclusive. We will also uh, make use of the uh, formula that uh, you heard about earlier in the week, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, from Daniel Gossett. Okay. So, can I get this to move? There we go. All right. Oops. There we go. Okay, so, so this is the outline for, uh, for the main talk. Uh, I'll talk about uh, symmetry and uh, how it's related to preserving quantum information. Uh, I'll talk about uh, system bath, decoherence, and uh, then I'll talk about how we can uh, understand a whole bunch of uh, buzzwords here uh, in terms of, uh, of the unified perspective and that comes from this uh, the symmetry point of view. Uh, and then I'll talk about decoherence of subspaces and modes of subsystems, uh, both at the level of, uh, of theory, uh, examples, theoretical examples, and also uh, experimental examples. And then in the second half, uh, after the break, I'll switch gears and I'll, I'll talk about uh, dynamic decoupling, uh, which is a, a, a different method for uh, overcoming decoherence. Okay. Please, take this seriously. No, seriously. I mean, this is a tutorial, so do interrupt and do ask. Okay, so as we all learned in, in high school, in some cases, a little later in life, uh, symmetry is related to conservation laws. Okay, so uh, as you know, when you have translational symmetry, then uh, momentum is conserved. When you have rotational symmetry, angular momentum is conserved. So why not associate symmetry with the attempt to conserve quantum information? Okay, so that is the idea of decoherence of subspaces and, and noise of subsystem. Uh, they're a method to, to preserve information by hiding it, so to speak, from the environment. So here's a big open space of the system, and here there's a little quiet corner, and that little quiet corner is a decoherence of subspace where we're going to uh, store some protected degrees of freedom uh, which are going to represent uh, quantum information for us. For us. So uh, that's part one of the talk. And part two, as I mentioned, will be about dynamical decoupling, which is kind of a different strategy on the face of it, although intimately related to, uh, to the same idea of, uh, of hiding information. But more about that later. Okay, so I'd like to, to start by uh, reviewing once more where the errors come from. Mohammed talked about this a little bit. Uh, but let's, let's go back and understand in a more systematic way where uh, decoherence uh, arises. Okay, so you've seen this, uh, the Hamiltonian for uh, the universe, and it comprises a, a system Hamiltonian, a bath Hamiltonian, and a system bath Hamiltonian. Bath environment, same thing, I'll use, I'll use bath from now on. And the system bath Hamiltonian, uh, we can think of always, we can always decompose it uh, in terms of a sum of uh, system operators tensors with bath operators. Okay, now what is the, the standard procedure for arriving at the dynamics of the system alone? The system is our quantum computer, obviously. The standard trick is to propagate the density matrix of the joint system bath, starting from time zero, uh, via this joint Hamiltonian H, and then trace out the bath. Okay, and if you do that, you arrive at the so-called Krauss operator sum representation this expression here, 
um, <coughs> where typically these coefficients c sub k are positive. Okay, but not always. And this, this is an important comment I, I, I want to make right now. Uh, in most textbooks, you will find this expression and you will find that these coefficients c are positive numbers. But it doesn't always have to be the case. In fact, the c's are positive numbers if and only if the initial system mass state is one that is purely classically correlated. Or more precisely, one that has zero quantum discord. Okay, this is a recent result. Um, normally, people just plug in a tensor product state between the system and the bath there at time zero, so a, a, a totally unrelated <coughs> state. Uh, but that's not a general thing that can happen. The system and bath could start in a, even in an entangled state at time zero, or certainly in some kind of a other correlated state at time zero. And if, if that's the case, if the initial system bath state is one that has some quantum correlations in it. It could even be separable. It has some quantum correlations in it. Then you will find that these coefficients here can be negative. So the most general map you can get from the initial system state to the final system state is what's called a Hermitian map. When the coefficients C are positive, you get what's called a completely positive map. OK, and those are the workhorses of quantum information. Those are the ones you will always find in the quantum information textbook. But the more general scenario is where you get a Hermitian map with possibly negative coefficients. And, uh, and that is the, uh, the most general type of map that, that we can get from uh, this recipe, uh, this general recipe of uh, quantum dynamics. OK, uh, now, from now on, I will in fact assume that these coefficients are positive, uh, which means that this state is, the initial system that state is purely classically correlated. And, uh, and then from now on, I will only have to deal with the completely positive maps. OK, so what is decoherence? Uh, Muhammad gave one definition, uh, which uh, uh, involved, uh, well, it was a uh, definition for a qubit. And it involved uh, the decay of off that element, although it was careful to point out that if you change basis, uh, then um, this can, uh, the shape of the density matrix can change. I would like to define decoherence simply as anything that's non-unitary evolution of the system. Okay. And that, that's going to happen whenever uh, these operators, these cross operators here, um, are when, when there's more than one of them. And um, in that case, we get non-unitary evolution. OK, so that's the coherence in general. Now we can start to make approximations. And if we make uh, the so-called Markov approximation, where we assume that the, the bath has a very short memory time, or a very short correlation time, uh, then we can arrive at the Markovian master equation, the Limbaugh equation, which I also mentioned uh, extensively in, uh, in their numerical simulations of uh, uh, their qubits. Uh, and it, it, it has this form, uh, and the operators that appear in the Limbaugh equation are these uh, system operators uh, that appear in the system bath in the form. OK, so that's, that's the, the general origin of, of decoherence. And now, uh, in order to understand how we can overcome decoherence, Using symmetry, I want to go back to uh, a very simple classical problem. The idea is to try to use symmetry. Okay, so what, what if it should have been what if there is a symmetry? What if there is a symmetry? Let's um, consider the following simple game. We have uh, two coins. I've written down all four possible states of two coins. And now let's assume that we have an environment which has some kind of symmetry. And the symmetry is that the environment can only flip the two coins together. So if it flips the coins, it flips both of them together, it can do so at random times. That's totally out of our control. But it will always flip them together. So if that happens, OK, I don't know if you can see that, but kind of fast. But OK, so heads flips the tails, and tails flips the heads. All right. So now the question is, how do you reliably store a single bit, classical bit, of information in this system? Any ideas? Parity. Parity. I heard parity. OK, good. So indeed, parity is, is, is the answer. Of course, what we should do is define the state heads-heads 
along with the stead, the, the, the state the tails tails as a single, let's say, logical unit. And so that's the even parity subspace. The odd parity subspace is going to be a logical one. Now, because the environment can only flip both bits at the same time, if it goes from heads heads to tails tails, we don't care. We still call that zero. Okay. So this this is a noiseless subspace, a classical noiseless subspace. We've exploited symmetry in order to store information in a robust manner. No matter how, how fast the environment does the flipping. Okay, so in other words, no matter how strong the interaction is. Remember in the long talk, it was important that the, in the system that coupling was weak. Here, I, I do not care about strength. The interaction can be as strong as you wish in the sense that this flipping can happen at, at whatever rate, but it has to have a symmetry. As long as it has a symmetry, the strength is irrelevant. Using the symmetry, we can perfectly store a classical in this case. OK, so if you understand this, you can pretty much go to sleep. Uh, the rest is quantum details. <laughs> but maybe some of them will be interesting. All right. So now, keep in mind this idea of symmetry. I, I want to digress and uh, present a unified mathematical view of all these different error correction and error prevention methods. Um, there are all these, I say, all, all these referring to error correction is probably what Daniel Gottman talked about. And error prevention is what I'm going to talk about. So <clears throat> let's start again with the error model. Here it is, complete positive maps. Okay, I got rid of my coefficients CK. I can absorb them when they're positive. I can just absorb them in a cross operator. And let me now define what a decoherence free subspace is. So, decoherence free subspace, quantum decoherence free subspace, unlike the classical one we just saw, is the following beast. We take the system Hilbert space and we split it up into a direct sum of two subspaces, A and B. A decoherence free subspace is a code. A code is a subspace itself. Okay? So, a code C, it's all those states, all density matrices, on A, such that the noise, the action of the noise map, is trivial, preserves <coughs> states. That's a decoherence free subspace. Okay, it's, very, it's a very simple idea. Pick a subspace and ensure that the action of the noise map is trivial on that subspace. Okay. What is a noiseless subspace? It's a slightly more complicated idea. Instead of just Splitting the Hilbert space into a tensor sum, let's assume that the first subspace, A, has additional structure. It is itself a tensor product. The noiseless part and what's called the gauge part. Okay. And now a noiseless subsystem is kind of a generalized decoherence subspace. What we, what we ask is that states are not just preserved if they are in A. A piece of them is preserved in the following sense. Okay? Take them at the noise map, apply it to states in A, and then trace out the gauge qubit, or the gauge, uh, not qubit, excuse me, the gauge subsystem. And if after this operation you got back just the piece that lives in N, then you have a noisy subsystem. Okay, so in other words, to simplify, we don't care about what happens to the gauge factor. We only care about what happens to the end factor. <coughs> That's a noiseless subsystem. This is a, a passive method of uh, protecting quantum information. We haven't done anything. We're just setting demands. Who, who are we to set demands? Well, we'll see if the environment uh, is willing to cooperate. Okay. We'll, we'll make it happen. What is a quantum aircraft control? Well, it's actually just like a decoherence free subspace with one extra piece. Again, we have a decomposition of the Hilbert space into A plus B. And our correcting code is all those states such that, in addition to what we said about the decoherence free subspace, there is some completely positive map, R, the recovery map, for which if we apply it to the noisy state, we get the, noise, we get the state back. Okay, that's an error correcting code. Well, the only difference is that we're adding this active component of recovery 
to the DFS definition. What is an operating, operator quantum error correction called? This is the most general form of quantum error correction known to date. It is actually a cousin of noise and substance. It's, you see, the same story. Now we have the gauge part. And now we also have the additional demand that we have to apply, we have to be able to apply a recovery map to the noise before we trace out the gauge part. And then get back the state. Okay, so this, this is an operator quantum error correcting code. So you see this hierarchy, there's a clear logical development there, uh, addition of structure. This is passive, we don't do anything. This is active because we, we're doing recovery. Now, from this perspective, we can think of a DFS as a quantum error correcting code or a quantum error correcting code as a DFS. Here again are the definitions of the two. And if you compare the definitions, you see that a DFS is just an error correcting code that has a trivial recovered average. Right? If, if R is identity, then, then we get the DFS definition. Back. An error correcting code is a DFS provided we take recovery applied to the noise together as the entire operation. So, so this, this is a unified view of differential subsystems and air correcting. Similarly, we can unify the subsystems and operator quantum air correcting codes. It's the same story. You know the subsystem is an OQEC with a trivial recovery operation, or an OQEC is an OQEC subsystem with respect to the map that is noise followed by recovery. Okay, so, so this, this is the unified view uh, of uh, these various different methods. Um, and it, it's kind of a powerful idea because it allows you to use results in one uh, in, in another. Okay, but this is in fact not the most general thing we can do because so far all I've, I've asked is to preserve my system. Right? We're just preserving systems. But of course you want to do more in quantum computation. In quantum computation you want to compute. So, the next thing we'd like to do is to be able to talk about decoherent free subspaces and the other members of this hierarchy, which are um, able to, to, uh, um, to support unitary operations. So this is what is called a unitarily invariant DFS. Unitarily for the unitarily invariant noise of substance. I'm only going to talk about the, the DFS uh, to keep it simple. So what's a unitarily invariant DFS? It's a subspace in which the evolution is purely unity. So far, the evolution was just identity in a DFS. Now I want it to be unitary in order for us to be able to apply some kind of uh, interesting computation. OK, so, so here's a more, more precise idea. Let's say that we can decompose the system Hilbert space into a direct sum like before, and I'm going to call it HD plus HD per. And now let's partition the system density matrix into blocks according to the same structure. Okay, so uh, row D is where I'm going to store my information. And I'm allowing three other blocks. The blocks correspond to this tensor sum. And let's assume that uh, where we're going to store the information, it's not empty. Okay, so row D is not zero at time zero. And note something important in this uh, decomposition. I'm allowing what I call imperfect initialization, which means that I'm, I'm allowing these three other pieces here to be non-zero. That's going to be OK. And so uh, even though uh, the, the other parts of the Hilbert space are going to be occupied, uh, even coherences between our decoherency subspace and the uh, orthogonal component, even coherences will be allowed. It's still going to be OK. And we will, we will be able to perfectly uh, evolve unitarily information in the DFS. OK, so what, what is now a DFS or a unitarily invariant DFS? HD, the, the piece where we're storing information, is, is decoherent free if and only if the initial and final DFS block, that's this, are unitarily related. Okay, so we want rho D at time 0 to evolve unitarily into rho D at time 0. And UD is a unitary matrix. OK, so this is just a definition. What are the conditions for this to happen? Can this ever be realized? And the answer is yes. So in the setting of completely positive maps, I'll, I'll give two characterizations of, of this. One, CP maps. The other one, uh, Lindlott uh, maps equations. So in the setting of CP maps, here's the CP map again. The theorem says 
that you can get the unitarily invariant DFS, one where information is, is stored and involved unitarily, provided that the Krauss operators have this particular form. Okay, they have to have a, a unitary, an identical unitary piece in the upper left-hand corner where we store information. Zero is on the off diagonal. The zeros ensure that there is no um, leakage into or out of uh, the, the DFS. And some arbitrary operator uh, down here on the right hand corner. Okay, and if, if all the cross operators have this form, that means that they act in a unitary way on the on the DFS. Okay, so this this is a, a, a formal characterization of, of what a unitarily invariant DFS is. And again, the question is whether this can ever be realized in real life. And of course the answer is yes. But before we go there, uh, what about the Markovian case? The Markovian case, uh, the the, the, the conditions are slightly different. Here is the, uh, uh, the system Hamiltonian acting on the state, and here are the, uh, the Lindblad operators uh, with response decoherence. And now we have to treat those two pieces separately. So we are going to get a unitarily invariant DFS provided the Lindblad operators have this kind of structure, just like the cross operators on the previous slide, uh, with an identity matrix here. But also, we have to make sure that the system Hamiltonian doesn't cause transitions outside of the DFS. Okay, so the, we need these zeros on, on the off diagonal so that the, the Hamiltonian itself is not going to be the culprit and cause leakage out of the DFS or into the DFS. We have to uh, keep these two things separately in check. Okay, so, so what does this mean? It means that the Lindblad operators act as identity on the DFS and the system Hamiltonian preserves it. That's the condition for unitarily invariant DFS, and you can uh, come up with conditions for uh, the other three types of uh, information preserving uh, structures. I challenge you to uh, prove the sufficiency and necessity uh, of these conditions that I uh, just presented. Okay, the sufficiency is easy, you just plug it in basically and see that it works out. The necessity is kind of hard, but it's doable. And then it would also be a very nice exercise to try to generalize these two theorems that I just presented to noise subsystems, accurate codes, and operators. <laughs> and don't look in the literature because it's been done. <laughs> Keeping it okay. All right. So, what about symmetry? And how do we how do we even find and, and, and make these DFS? So to see that, it is actually very instructive to go back all the way to the Hamiltonian uh, formulation of, of the problem. So once again, here is the, the standard Hamiltonian formulation. We have the system plus the system that plus the math Hamiltonian. And now what, what is that we want? What is the DFS? We want to find a subspace where the system math Hamiltonian acts trivial. <coughs> That's really all we're after. Right? If the system math Hamiltonian has has no way of coupling the system and the bath, then they will evolve separately. So in other words, we want to make the system bath Hamiltonian act as identity on the system, and it can do whatever it wants to the bath. We don't care. As long as the system bath Hamiltonian doesn't entangle system and bath, then uh, we're going to be fine. The other thing we have to keep in mind, as you recall from the, uh, the Lundblad case, is that we have to make sure that that system Hamiltonian itself doesn't mess us up. It shouldn't uh, cause transitions into or out of, of the DFS. Okay, so with this in mind, here's a theorem that's slightly more useful than, than the previous ones. This is not constructed. This tells us, given the system bath Hamiltonian, what it is that we need to do in order to identify the DFS. And it says the following Consider the algebra generated by the system operator. So by the algebra I've generated, what I mean is just take these S's, take their emission conjugates, uh, throw in an identity, right, mix it all up, create polynomials in these operators. That's the algebra. So consider this algebra, and let's assume that the system Hamiltonian is such that it commutes with this algebra. Okay, this is, as long as we can engineer our, our system, we should be able to take a system Hamiltonian which satisfies this demand. And this demand, of course, has to do with HS must preserve the DFS. All right, so now, theorem says that there is going to be a DFS. More precisely, the dimension of the DFS equals the degeneracy 
of the one-dimensional irreducible representations of this particle. Okay, so I know that's that's a mouthful, and I, I'm going to explain it. But already here, you should get the message connecting symmetry to the problem, because as every physicist knows, degeneracy arises from symmetry. Okay, so the, the, the fact that we're talking about degeneracy means that we are really looking for symmetry. Symmetry is in the way that system and bath couple. Okay, so here's an example, just to illustrate what's going on. The simplest example, the simplest non-trivial example. It's called collective defacing. So let's say that we have two qubits, and uh, they're in some, uh, some states, slide one and slide two. And let's say that there's, well, let's imagine these are spins. Uh, and let's say there's a magnetic field, which has a long wavelength. Remember the example of the two coins flipping? Why, why was the environment, in the case of the two coins, unable to uh, independently flip the two coins? It, it could only do them together. It's because it had a long wavelength in some sense. Okay, so this is the same situation. We have a long wavelength environment. Uh, and all it does is it is going to uh, couple along the z direction. I mean, camera that is exactly. Uh, so uh, the the, res the result of this is that the state of each qubit, qubit j, uh, is going to acquire a phase, a relative phase, and this phase theta <coughs> is a random number. But the important point is that it doesn't depend on the index j. In other words, it doesn't depend on whether the qubit is qubit number one or qubit number two. Okay, so that is the collectiveness, the symmetry uh, that I'm assuming. So let's let's say that's the model. In terms of the Hamiltonian, what, what I'm saying is that my Hamiltonian is a collective operator of sigma z1 plus, sorry, this should have been two, plus sigma z2 coupled to some bath operator. But the point is that there's the same bath operator coupling to the two sigma polymatrices. Okay, it is not sigma z1 b1 plus sigma z2 b2. No, the coupled collection. Now this Hamiltonian is trivial to, to write down in diagonal lines. It's, it's already diagonal in the uh, computational basis of the up down state, the zero one state. And what you see is that there is a degenerate subspace. Remember the theorem from the previous slide it was talking about how the dimension of the DFS is the degeneracy of the one dimensional irreducible representations. All the irreducible representations here are one dimensional. Uh, and there is one irreducible representation, which is two, which is two dimensional. It has degeneracy two. So that suggests that we should encode, just like in quantum Rehrer encodes, but now we're doing degeneracy subsets encoding, we should encode our qubit into these two states. The up down, we'll call it 0, 1, and the 1, 0. Okay? So these, these two yellow states here became the blue states down there. That's our logical qubit. It's protected. Why? Because the environment acts in an identical manner on, on those two qubits. Here, if you don't see it, then let me do it in excruciating detail. Here is the uh, uh, the transformation once again with that same phase, that's hence collectively fading. Here's what happens to our two qubits. The state 0, 0 is unchanged. The state 0, 1 acquires a phase e to the i theta. The state 1, 0 also acquires a phase e to the i theta. And the state 1, 1 acquires a phase e to the 2 i theta. Now, a global phase, as Mohammed mentioned in his first talk today, a global phase is irrelevant. Okay, so if we call these two states our logical zero and logical one, this is like the odd character subspace, then any linear superposition of, of these two states is going to be decoherence free. Because all it gets from the environment is a global phase. So it will not decohere. There will, however, be decoherence between this state, the zero zero state, and, and this state because they get a relative phase. Okay, and that phase is random. Depends on how long the environment is, is coupling the two. So there will be decoherence between the zero zero and the zero one state, but not between the zero one and the one zero state. And that's why we should stick our quantum information in there. And we, 
what we get is a two-dimensional protected substrate, two-dimensional decoherence free substrate. Okay, so this is really not much more complicated than the example of, of the two coins, except that now we're working with phases as, uh, as opposed to flipping. Oh, yeah. Any ideas? Are these two states also in DFS? Is the state 0, 0 a DFS? Yes or no? Well, it's kind of a trivial DFS. It's just a single state, okay? But it's, it is. It's, it is a one-dimensional irreducible representation. Uh, but it has degeneracy 1, so you wouldn't want to store any information in it. It's like having a, only one side of a coin to work with. Not very useful. So here is where you want to store your information. That's the, uh, the actual full cube. Okay, so now on to noiseless subsystems. So remember, I talked about noiseless subsystems. We had this issue with the, how the subspace A got decomposed into N tensor G. All right, so let's see how, how that shows up in, uh, in this context of symmetry and, and irreducible representation. Uh, as uh, was uh, realized in, in this beautiful paper by Neil Flom and, and Viola uh, a decade ago, in fact, this condition of that one dimensional irreducible representation is not needed. The 1D is not needed. Okay. So this, the mathematical formalism behind it is a little heavy, but it's not too bad. Uh, here again is the model of decoherence. We have a system of interaction. And just like before, let's consider the algebra of polynomials in the system operators, their emission conjugates, and the identity operators. Let's consider this algebra. And let's assume that we have n qubits. Okay, so if we have n qubits, then we have a, a Hilbert space which is c two to the n. It's a two to the n Hilbert space. Now, if you think about what this, the action of the algebra is on this space Hilbert space of n qubits, it, this generates a representation of the algebra, and this representation breaks up into irreducible representations. Now, how does it do that? Well, there's a general theorem. Um, which says that this algebra is isomorphic to a tensor sum over tensor products. The sum is over labels that are called the irreducible representations, just like an angular momentum theory. And the amazing thing is that this tensor sum is composed of tensor products where each tensor product contains an identity algebra times some matrix. So the identity here is what's going to be key for us. This is somehow the, the whole secret to being able to store information. Because this algebra is what causes the errors. And if the errors act as identity, then they're not errors. All right. So what is the dimension of these identity operators? It's exactly the multiplicity of the j irreducible representation, or the degeneracy. Multiplicity and degeneracy means the same thing. And what's the dimension of these matrices here? These, what these matrices are are relevant. The only thing that we need to know about them is what's their dimension. Their dimension is whatever the dimension is, dj. Okay, so once you have the structure, the Hilbert space, the system Hilbert space, decomposes accordingly. It decomposes into a tensor sum of tensor products. Each tensor product has a piece that is nj dimensional, the multiplicity or the degeneracy, times dj dimensional. Okay. Each one of these J's, each one of these irreducible representation labels, labels a noiseless subsystem code. Okay, so where we store information is in one of the elements of this tensor sum. Let's take out one of them. Let's say the first of the J. That J is associated with a subsystem that is nj dimensional. nj, once again, is the degeneracy, or the multiplicity of the j representation. And this is where we're going to put our information. That's a noise of substance. What's a DFS? A DFS is the somewhat trivial case where the corresponding dimension of the irreducible representation is just one. 
Okay. When the fourth, when when the dimension is one, then when you do the trace out piece, remember tracing out G, n tensor G. You're tracing out G. Well, there's nothing to trace out when the dimension is one. That's how you get a DFS. Okay. What is the interesting case? When when do we actually gain from this kind of structure? We gain when the um, multiplicity, the degeneracy, is greater than one. Okay, so I gave an example with the collective defacing where the degeneracy was greater than one. We had a degeneracy of two. When does that happen? It happens if there's some symmetry. Because degeneracy is connected to symmetry. That's Noether's theorem. All right, so this is the general structure uh, for Noether subsystems. And, and this is actually, although I know, and I know that it looks very abstract, it is actually a constructive recipe for finding Noether subsystems. What do you need to do constructively? Well, somebody hands you a system bath homotony. You plug it into Mathematica and ask it to find uh, the irreducible representations, and it will spit them out. And then uh, you can uh, find the one that has the largest uh, degeneracy, and that's where you're going to put your quantum information. OK, so, so here's an example. Um, I talked about collective dephasing. Let's make the model more interesting. Let's say that we don't just have collective dephasing. We have collective decoherence. Uh, so collective decoherence is uh, errors in all directions, but they're all a long wavelength. Okay, so we have a, uh, a long wavelength magnetic field along z, along x, and along y. Here again are our two qubits. And this, this could be, for example, uh, the situation at low temperature when decoherence is due to phonons. Okay, so formally the error model is described by a system of Hamiltonian that has collective error operators acting on the system. Once again, there's no B alpha J. There's just a single B alpha. Alpha is X, Y, or Z, depends on which direction the error is. And each B alpha is coupled to a collective spin operator, a total spin operator. Okay. So that's at the that's at the level of Hamiltonians. You can also think of it at the level of, of uh, CP maps, if you prefer. Uh, then the state is transformed into a collective rotation with some probability. Uh, collective rotation along x, probability p1, etc. Okay. This, this, this is an entirely equivalent way of looking at the problem. One is at the level of Hamiltonians, the other one is at the level of CPMS. Collective rotations versus collective generators of rotations, which would be Hamiltonians. All right, so now how do we find the DFSs in the noise of subsystems? We have to do the uh, analysis in terms of the irreducible representation of the Lie algebra SU2 because that's what we're dealing with here. Okay, this is S alpha, S X, S Y, S Z together generate SU2 on n qubits. So we're trying to decompose SU2 on n qubits into its irreducible representation. And fortunately, there's a very nice graphical way of, of uh, seeing how that's done. It's called the Bertelli diagram. Um, and the Bertelli diagram goes like this. So over here, I'm plotting the total state, which I'm calling J. And over here, I'm plotting the number of qubits. All right, so let's say that we have nothing. Okay, so zero qubits have zero state. Now let's say I have one qubit. It's a spin one half particle, so I'm going to put a point here. Let's have two qubits. So I have two qubits. They can either form a spin zero state or a spin one state. If I have three qubits, they can form a spin one half state or a spin three half state, etc. Et okay, so that, that's the beginning of the Bartelli diagram. Now, what is this formula? How is it represented? The Hilbert space decomposition. What, what does it actually mean in this case? So here I'm assuming that uh, n, sorry, this is capital N, it should have been lowercase n, and n whether capital or lowercase is the number of qubits. So let's fix an n. Let's say n is 2. OK, so when n is 2, I have one way, this path, up, down, to get to spin 0. Remember that when I talked about the uh, theorem for decoherence with subspaces, I was talking about the one-dimensional irreducible representations. This is the only one-dimensional irreducible representation uh, for, for two spins. There's also a three-dimensional representation up here. But this one is the one that will give me uh, a decoherence-free qubit. And this 
this is the uh, this is the state. Okay. Now for for three physical qubits, there are two ways to get to this point. Now we now it's interesting. Now we have a degeneracy. I can go up, down, up, or I can go up, up, down. Now there is a degeneracy. The degeneracy is reflected in the number of paths leading to a given point in the Bertelli diagram. So here are these two paths, a uh, part of them. And I, wrote also, I also wrote down one states. To get the actual states, you, you, you can't just read them off easily from the Bertelli diagram. You actually have to calculate the coordinate coefficients. Um, so when you do that, you find that these are the two states corresponding to these two paths which lead to the same point on the Bertelli diagram. Again, path is like degeneracy. Paths leading to the same point tells you the degeneracy of an irreducible representation. Here we have an uh, uh, irreducible representation that is um, uh, 2 half plus 1, so two-dimensional, um, and it's uh, twice degenerate. Okay, so this, this actually gives you a qubit. This just gives you a single state. I think I misspoke earlier. I said this is a qubit. It's not. It's just a single state. Okay? It's a decoherence-free state. Here we have an actual qubit. In decoherence, we have a noiseless substance from qubit because it's not associated with a, a singlet. Singlets are uh, the states that live on the, uh, on the horizontal axis. Here's another one. Um, two paths, up, down, up, down, and up, up, down, down. These two also give you a decoherence free qubit. This is really a, a DFS. It's associated with the, uh, the singlet state. Okay. Again, the singlets live on, 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 the, uh, on the horizontal axis. And that's uh, what the actual states are. So if you're looking for subject to collective decoherence, if you're looking for the smallest possible protected qubit, you'll find it right here. Small in the sense that it uses up the uh, least number of physical qubits. Only three physical qubits are used in order to get to this point. Or you can use four and get here, or, okay, you see the numbers, right? So uh, two is a qubit, uh, uh, four would be two protected qubits, and five is, um, well, two five it, whatever you call that. Okay, so in, in this way, this diagram actually, uh, it, uh, uh, decomposes the space space precisely according to this formula. You fix n, let's say we fix n at 4 now, the number of physical qubits is 4. What is this formula saying? It's saying j equals 0, we have uh, a two-dimensional, uh, uh, sorry, a twice degenerate irreducible representation, and a three, three wise degenerate irreducible representation, and another one here that's only one. Okay, and in this way, for each value of n, you're decomposing the moment space, and you can read off all the decoherence of subspaces and run the subspaces. Okay, now, how does this thing scale? What, what is the rate of these codes? Um, in uh, Daniel Gottesman's lecture, he probably talked about uh, the, the rate of codes. Uh, and the rate is some, some kind of measure of their performance. It tells you how many physical qubits in, gives you how many physical qubits out. And of course, you want to get as many physical qubits, uh, as many excuse me, logical qubits out. You want to get as many logical qubits out per physical qubits in as possible. So these codes are actually sort of amazing in that regard. Uh, this is the, the general formula for uh, any point along the Bartelli diagram. And in particular, if you're looking for the singlets, which is j equals 0, the number of encoded qubits to, to physical qubits is the log base 2 of, of this expression divided by the number of physical qubits. And as n gets large, it goes to 1 minus a logarithmic correction. OK, so asymptotically, the number of decoherence free qubits actually fills up the entire open space. OK, this is the code that has an asymptotic rate of 1. Of course, if life were only that good, I mean, there's, there's a small assumption here, which is that our errors act in a symmetric way. And, well, maybe they don't. All right. Okay, so far I talked about, I talked about storage. But what about computation? So, in order to prevent the events, we have to make sure 
that the computation doesn't exit the Hilbert state of the protected substance. The DFS or the noise of substance. So what, what are the compatible logical operations? What is it that we're allowed to do? This is like the question about normalizers in an accurate code. You have a state logic code, the normalizer tells you what are the allowed operations on that code. So we can ask a similar question here, which in fact is, uh, includes the normalizer, stabilizer uh, thing as, as a special case. And the answer comes from that uh, formula, uh, the uh, IRAP formula for the error algebra. So, so, so here it is again. Uh, this is the associative algebra of the errors. And here is the decomposition of the Hilbert space. And here is the code subsystem where we're going to store information. We're storing information in the degeneracy of the J-theoretical representation. Now, the allowed operations, the answer to what are the allowed operations, comes from this observation. There are operators, the, 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 the commutant, which commute with the error algebra. A prime, all those operators which have this dual structure where they, uh, there's some matrix, tensor, and identity, which is precisely the opposite of this structure. Okay, the dual structure. Obviously, any operator that can be written in this form commutes with the errors. If an error commutes, if an operator commutes with the errors, that means that it doesn't couple to the errors. Okay? So the errors are not going to mess up that operation. So that operation, M prime, acts precisely in the right place. It acts on our code subsystem. And it acts in a way which will not be messed up by the errors, because it commutes with the errors. So those are the allowed logical operations. Um, it turns out that uh, for an important example, uh, namely for collective decoherence, uh, we can identify uh, specifically what, uh, what these allowed logic operations are. It turns out they are precisely the so-called Heisenberg interactions. Okay, so Heisenberg interaction is, is an interaction of this form. It's a pairwise interaction between qubits. Uh, it uh, is symmetric uh, between x, y, and z. It couples uh, pairs of qubits. And it also turns out that it's possible to perform universal computation in the sense of the, the circuit model, not in the sense of the adiabatic one, in the sense of the circuit model. It's possible to universally compute using just the Heisenberg interaction by turning on and off these uh, coupling parameters, JIJ, over uh, these um, noise of subsystems uh, type codes that, uh, that I've described to you. So Heisenberg interaction is universal all by itself over these codes over noise of subsystem codes and decoherency subspace codes. OK, so here, here it is in, uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, here is the Heisenberg exchange interaction again. And let's write the exchange operators, uh, x, i, j, etc. Uh, let's just call them e, i, j. And they, it's called Heisenberg exchange because you can show that this operator e, i, j is actually like a small. Okay, it acts just like a swap. So um, you can ask, well, what are the operations which implement computation using exchange operations? So if you look at the four qubit DFS, remember the four qubit DFS? It was this uh, this code. If you remember my conventions, okay, this is what I call logical zero, and this is logical one. <laughs> um, so, uh, <clears throat> over this 4 qubit DFS, you can identify explicitly what the exchange operations are that implement logical x and logical z. Logical x is an operator which interchanges logical 0 and logical 1. Logical z is one that puts a relative phase between logical 0 and logical 1. Okay, so it's, it's very easy to check that indeed the exchange uh, let's say qubits 1 and 2 puts a relative phase between them. I think we can check that uh, right now. So exchange 1 and 2 means flip 0 and 1, flip 1 and 0 right here. So that, that's going to pull out a minus sign. Okay, but so it puts a minus sign on logical 0, but it does nothing to logical 1 because you see the first two qubits are always the same here. Uh, here and here, and here they, uh, they come in a way that uh, cancels the, the operation. So, so we get a minus sign on the zero, no, we get a plus sign on the one, and therefore negative exchange one, two, implements the logical z operation. Okay, 
And you can check that logical x, the thing that interchanges zero, logical zero, logical one, is this sum of two generators. So once we have logical z and logical x as generators, we can exponentiate them. These are terms in the Hamiltonian, okay? So this, this is where it connects to this other model we're talking about. I'm working at the level of Hamiltonians now. These are not, these are not gates. This is not an, an x gate or a z gate. This is an x in the Hamiltonian. It's a, it's a sum exchange object. It's a piece in the Hamiltonian. So I can imagine turning it on and off for the right amount of time to turn on e to the i theta x bar, e to the i theta z bar. And now I can generate arbitrary single encoded DFS gates. Okay? So the single encoded DFS gates are easy. They're generated by these operators. The control not, the encoded control not, is very hard. It involves 42 elementary steps. Uh, by elementary step, I mean operations generated by turning on and off some sequence of exchange operations. Uh, and you can find the details in, in David Bacon's PhD thesis, where this was worked out. Um, so this actually has implications beyond protecting information. Um, it, I guess, uh, let's see, five or more years ago, there was, there was, there was some excitement in the quantum dots community because uh, it was realized that uh, using exchange operations alone, they could implement universal quantum computation. It comes straight out of these results. Uh, and uh, in, in the quantum dots community at the time, it was thought to be very hard to implement uh, single physical qubit operations. They wanted to do everything with exchange because exchange operations are very fast in, in quantum dots and also relatively easy to generate. Uh, so for a while there was some excitement because people thought that this would be a good way to actually perform universal computation in quantum dots uh, using these codes and then using just exchange operations to do everything. I think by now uh, other methods have been discovered which actually go back to just addressing single physical qubits uh, optically and, electri and electrically which uh, may obviate the need for, uh, for this method. But who knows, it might uh, come back. All right, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about the experiments that have been done to uh, confirm the existence of, uh, of DFSs uh, and or the substances. So the, the very first experiment was performed uh, by uh, <coughs> Paul Friot and, and his group. Um, and it was an, an, an optics experiment uh, using parametric down conversion. They generated uh, pairs of entangled photons. So here is the, uh, the scheme of the experiment. This is a, a two qubit or two photon experiment. And, and the goal is to generate the single state. This state right here. Okay. <clears throat> and to show that it is uh, robust against collective decoherence or collective, collective, yes, collective decoherence. Okay, so um, here is the uh, photon source. You get two photons coming out of uh, this parametric kind of non-conversion process. They go through a half wave plates, and they go through some quartz uh, plates, which are uh, what generates the, uh, the decoherence. Uh, and in this experiment, which is somewhat, somewhat artificial, uh, these quartz uh, plates were uh, were taken were, were manufactured to be as identical as possible, so that the decoherence would be collective, identical on the two photons. Okay, and then there is some uh, tomography set up here which uh, you need in order to, uh, to, to get the results. And what they saw is summarized in, in this graph. Uh, I, I hope uh, everybody's a little bit familiar with reading these kind of uh, tomography plots. Basically what you're seeing here are the four polarization states, horizontal and vertical polarization. And the, uh, the four bars up here represent a singlet state. If you think about the density matrix and the horizontal vertical basis, the singlet state, the, the one that is 0, 1, minus 1, 0, over root 2, this state is these four vertical bars. The other three are the other three states uh, that belong to the triplet. And as you can see, they, their amplitude is diminished. They have decoherence. here. Okay, whereas the singlet state has been, it's a little hard to tell from this experiment, it was the first experiment, but you can sort of see that the singlet state went through and didn't, didn't get damaged. This is the, uh, the tomography of the singlet state as the output. It got preserved with some high fidelity. The tomography of the free singlet state shows that they got damaged by decoherence. 
Okay, so this experiment demonstrated that the singlet state is indeed robust to collective decoherence. Okay, this was in, in 2000. Uh, a year later was the first experiment on noise of subsystems. It was the, the three qubit noise of subsystem. Remember the Bertelli diagram with the, <coughs> the two paths uh, leading to the same point with three physical qubits. That's precisely what was tested here uh, using nimplomagnetic resonance on this uh, alanine uh, molecule. So the, uh, the molecule has uh, uh, three carbon atoms uh, which are isotopically labeled and can be distinguished. And uh, uh, it's possible to control the interactions between them, these J's here. Um, so uh, the experiment prepared the noiseless subsystem qubit over three physical qubits, the uh, nuclear spin one half of each of these uh, uh, carbon atoms. And the hydrogens uh, in, the, in this molecule uh, provide the environment. The hydrogens are, are spin one half, so they are like a spin out uh, coupled into these, uh, these carbons. Uh, and what, what they saw, uh, they measured fidelity, entanglement fidelity as a function of noise strength. So noise strength here is, how exactly they did it, I, I don't recall. Uh, but noise strength is, is uh, in a sense, the rate at which you're, you're doing the flip. Like the, the, the rate at which uh, I was flipping the, uh, the two coins in uh, the beginning of the talk. Uh, and what you see is remarkable. You see that no matter how strong the noise, these curves here, which represent the entanglement fidelity of the noiseless qubit, are totally flat. Okay, and this this confirms this prediction that when you have symmetry protecting your information, it doesn't matter how strong the system valve coupling is. The information is protected, independent of strength. Whereas if you uh, if you just look at uh, a raw qubit, uh, it decays. Its fidelity decays as, as a function of the noise. Now you may be wondering why these curves are so much lower, and that, that would be a good question. And the answer is that it takes a while to prepare the, the noiseless qubit. Okay, so you lose a lot of entanglement fidelity just through the preparation step. But once you have it prepared, then it's robust. Okay, and they, they took it out to the regime where you saw where you can see that the fidelity actually is better for the noiseless qubit than it is for the uh, hundred. Okay, so this was 2001. Uh, then 2004, there was an experiment again in quantum optics, not involving the four qubit DFS, once again this one. Uh, and uh, using uh, two pairs of, of entangled photons. And in this case, uh, you see the, the, the U's here represent collective rotation. So every photon uh, underwent the, the same rotation operation, random rotation U. Um, and once again, tomography results, uh, what, what they're showing here is the input state and the output state. And they uh, decided to prepare this particular superposition of the logical zero and the logical one, uh, square root three, logical zero, minus logical one. Okay, and that's what this state is, and you see that the input is essentially identical to the output. Okay, so this collective uh, decoherence channel was unable uh, to damage this, uh, this protected qubit. Okay, so once again, a nice demonstration of how it works. Okay, well, the next question is, all right, so we have, we have this nice symmetry, we're assuming that there's a symmetry, but what if it's broken? What if, what if the symmetry is imperfect? So if the symmetry is imperfect, um, well, it could be either weakly imperfect or very imperfect. But let's uh, imagine this perturbative regime where it's weakly imperfect. We just introduced perturbation onto the system baffle Hamiltonian, and that has some strength epsilon. But we're assuming that uh, the system baffle Hamiltonian has a symmetry, a symmetry that gives rise to the DFS or the subsystem. And then this extra piece, delta H, doesn't have any symmetry. Okay, and let's characterize the strength of this perturbation by epsilon. And then what you can show is that the, the DFS or the, the NS, the normal subsystem, is going to uh, be stable to first order. So you can show that automatically you have protection to first order in epsilon, and the fidelity is uh, perturbed only to second order in this parameter epsilon under symmetry okay, So This is a little bit like the result for, uh, for error correcting codes, except that with error correcting codes, because we have this additional active correction step, we can perfectly restore the fidelity with the DFS. 
it only lives for uh, a short time, depending on, on the value of epsilon. And in fact, there was an experiment which, uh, which tested this, once again from <coughs> Paul Creo's group. So they looked at the, uh, the two qubit uh, DFS. Uh, so this should remind you of the first experiment in the Quia group, except that there's uh, some additional components here. Um, and the, uh, without getting into, into the details of the experiment, what, what they checked was the robustness to a perturbation epsilon. Uh, so there's a, um, here is the single state. Here are the three triplet states. I, I don't know how easy you just see it from the distance, but uh, if you if you look carefully, you will see that the simplest state, as a function of the perturbation, it, the fidelity drops off quite radically. Okay, so here the fidelity is perfect. That's when the uh, the two qubits, the two physical qubits, are rotated by the same by the same amount at random times. So they're both rotated by 15 degrees at random times. And then over here is when one of them is rotated by 15 degrees, but the other one is rotated by slightly less, and you see how the fidelity drops off. Uh, quadratic. Okay, so that's this first order stability result. That's to uh, rotation errors and then to strength uh, errors. Uh, same story. Single state over here, uh, 140 waves is uh, the, the benchmark, and then if you rotate, if you apply a, a thicker plate to the second qubit or a thinner plate to the second qubit, you see that the fidelity only drops off um, quadratic. Okay, so this demonstrates the, uh, the robustness of, of a DFS to first order. Now, what about strong symmetry breaking? So we had perfect symmetry, we had weak symmetry breaking, strong symmetry breaking. This is an experiment um, which was not really um, meant to demonstrate strong symmetry breaking. Uh, at least uh, you won't find that in, uh, in, in the article, but I'm interpreting it in this way. Uh, this is a, a demonstration of a DFS uh, from uh, Big Wineland's group using trapped ions. Okay, so uh, two beryllium ions, and the, uh, uh, the physical qubits here are hard to find states of each ion, and uh, the uh, sources of decoherence are two, primarily. One is fluctuating long wavelength ambient magnetic fields. So if you, if you know how uh, an ion trap experiment works, you have these Paul traps that have these lengthy electrodes, lengthy relative to the distance between the ions, and that provide electromagnetic confinement. And these electrodes had, at least used to back in those days, I think the situation improved somewhat, they used to have these kind of random magnetic fields, long wavelength, uh, that would just occur spontaneously and nobody really understood why. Um, and they were causing these parents. But the key is long wavelength relative to the distance between the ions. So that's one, <coughs> one source of decoherence. The other one is the heating of the ion center of mass motion. Now, source number one obviously has a symmetry, okay? It has its perturbation symmetry, long wavelength. Source number two, the heating of the ion center of mass motion, has no symmetry at all. So here we have a case where we have something that's going to allow a DFS, something that's going to break the DFS. And that's actually what is seen in the, in the experiment. Here you have some measure of coherence as a function of time. And you see that if you don't do the DFS encoding, the coherence decays exponentially very fast. And if you do the DFS encoding, uh, this DFS that we saw earlier, uh, the coherence lives a little longer, about five times longer in this experiment, which means that you protect it against source number one, but it still falls out exponentially. And that's because you haven't done anything to protect it against source number two. Okay, so this is a case of strong symmetry breaking, uh, which we have to deal with. And indeed, that's what I'm going to do after the break. Any questions?
So you pick two of them and call one of them the logical zero state and the other logical one state. And that's the EFS. Well, if you, uh, if you have a lot of physical qubits, you can do more than just a single logical zero logical one. You can create right. lots of right, logical right. qubits. Right, right. Okay? Yeah. In fact, for the case that you described where it's collective dephasing, just the D component, uh, you just need two physical qubits to create um, a single logical qubit. And uh, the, the combinatorics is actually easy. It's very easy. The combinatorics is just the, the binomial formula. Nothing right. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, that part I understand. Okay. So for the n uh, noiseless subsystem, is it because if you have enough qubits, physical qubits, you, then you can always have two irreducible representations with the same j. Then you pick the corresponding jz part at 0 and 1. So they, they have relatively no noise. I hesitate to say yes. The, uh, the way to think about it is, uh, for a given value of j, the total j, find the degeneracy. Yeah. And the degeneracy is going to tell you the dimension of the noiseless subsystem. Right. Or of the decoherency subspace if it happens to be dj equals 1. Yes. Yeah. Okay? So the noiseless subsystem, you can only pick the, the ones with Jz, the same value, is that right? You have to pick the ones with the same Jz. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right.